Good afternoon, everyone. Um, welcome to this panel discussion on designing future energy systems. This session forms part of the Energy Futures Lab two day public showcase of energy research from, a, from across Imperial College London uh, and it's hosted every two years. So my heartfelt welcome to all of you. Uh, we have a great lineup of speakers here and I hope the, you find the event very, very interesting. So I'm Professor Adam Hawkes. So I'm Director of the Sustainable Gas Institute at Imperial College London and, and a professor in the Department of Chemical Engineering. I, I also contribute to energy modelling activities in the Grantham Institute for Climate Change and the Energy Futures Labs and various projects around Imperial College. Imperial has a really rich ecosystem of energy research, as I'm sure you've already seen from events today. Um, there's a huge amount of technology research uh, and a huge amount of systems research alongside that. So the session today on designing future energy systems is really focused on the systems side of that, where we think about how to design those future energy systems and how, how do we make a system which is net zero emissions, which is the UK's 2050 target. Uh, how does it, all the bits and pieces of that fit together, different sectors, different technologies? How does it all come together to create a working cost-effective energy system that can achieve those low carbon aims? Um, I'm sure all of you know the way energy systems work today is, is quite different to this. If you look worldwide, they're relatively carbon intensive relying mainly on fossil fuels. But if you look in 50 or 70 years time, you see a completely different system being projected by particularly energy system models, which I'll describe in a moment. So that radical change is the challenge that Imperial researchers are trying to address here. How do we get from here, from this fossil fuel system, primarily to that future integrated low carbon system? So energy system models, which is the, the majority of the discussion today, will be focused on these tools to help us understand that transition pathway and how that future system works. They have a, a range of different inputs from things such as demand levels and fuel prices. They typically cover several sectors of the economy, although some of them are quite focused on specific sectors. Inputs tend to be things like prices and performance of technologies and outputs tend to be things like energy consumptions, costs and well how do you operate these systems in an integrated fashion. A typical approach here is cost optimization uh, so it takes a very single decision maker view on this like the policy makers view on the social optimum of how to achieve a low carbon energy system. It's a really interesting research area. It, it drives policy in many different ways. If you look at the COP26 uh, and the IPCC reports, you would have seen a lot of different modeling efforts going into that. Uh, indeed, the, the overall pathways and targets set by UNFCCC, informed by the IPCC, is driven by energy systems modeling. So hugely important tools, which I, I hope you'll enjoy hearing about today. So in this session, I'm joined by Imperial workers, uh, researchers designing these systems of tomorrow. So I'm joined by Dr. Marco Anudi, who's a research fellow, and uh, lecturer Dr. Fei Tang. They're both in the Department of Electrical Engineering and PhD students Maria Uliruka and Diego Moya, both based in chemical engineering. So we, we're gonna kick off today's session by hearing from each one of these panelists in turn. So they're just going to speak for a few minutes, three to four minutes, introducing themselves and their research, uh, hopefully giving you some insight onto the latest exciting developments in the field of energy systems. So there is a Q&A box you'll see to the right of your screen. Please feel free to add, add your comments in there and we'll address them in a, in a, in a Q&A session at the end of the four, four lightning talks. So now, firstly, I want to hand over to Dr. Marco Anudi for the first presentation. Great, 
Thank, thanks very much, Adam. Uh, so my name is Marco Aunedi. I'm uh, from uh, the electrical, depart electrical engineering department uh, at Imperial. Um, my research has been uh, on uh, analyzing low carbon energy systems for probably around the last 15 years. Uh, so what I try to do is uh, uh, look at how we should best design uh, the future energy systems to help us meet the decarbonization goals at the lowest possible cost. There's all sorts of questions that fall into that uh, uh, bracket. For example, uh, what's, what sort of technology mix do we need? Uh, do we need to invest in flexibility? So things like energy storage, uh, demand type response. Um, how does the decarbonization of heat and transport fit into that? For example, uh, if we electrify the transport using uh, electric vehicles, how does that impact uh, our energy system? Or if we decide to provide our low carbon heat uh, using some other vectors such as hydrogen, what would that mean and how we could uh, link those different sectors uh, together? So I've been looking at these questions for a while. As I said, uh, I've, I've worked with, uh, well, both in a number of uh, academic projects within Imperial, uh, the most notable of which is called IDLES. So that's the one uh, w w which is ongoing at the moment and which uh, uh, collects a large number of uh, uh, Imperial academics. Uh, but I've also consulted a number of institutions such as the government and the regulator and the Climate Change Committee on uh, what these, uh, uh, what different pathways uh, these uh, energy systems uh, could take in the future. Um, so just a, a really quick one to say what, what's the kind of the exciting thing on the horizon. So uh, we've recently published uh, a white paper saying that our net zero carbon electricity uh, uh, going forward should mostly be uh, based on uh, offshore wind generation in the case of the UK because of a very good natural resource. Uh, but of course, uh, there's a valid question of can we rely on that wind always, uh, uh, not just from day to day, but also can, what happens if you had a if you had a period of a, a few weeks of very low wind output? How do you defend? How do you uh, ensure yourself against that? So that's something we are looking at uh, at the moment. And yeah, I'm happy to elaborate later if there's uh, if there's an, if there's a, if there's a uh, moment for that. Thank you very much, Marco. Uh, now we'll turn to Dr. Fei Tang for an introduction. Thanks. Um, um, hello, everyone. Uh, good afternoon. Um, my name is Fei Tang. I'm a lecturer in uh, AAA department and also education director for Energy Futures Lab. I'm so glad to have this um, opportunity to be part of the festival. Um, Today, I would like to discuss a bit my uh, my work regarding the digitalization of future electricity systems. I think most of you are aware that um, the benefits of digitalization that may bring to the system through a uh, great observability, uh, enhanced controllability, and hence more uh, higher efficiency, and how what is the role to um, improve uh, to support the cost effective transition to zero carbon energy systems. However, one um, particular part that normally overlooked is the uh, unavoidable risk uh, it brings when we uh, hand over uh, more and more uh, decisions and monitorings to autonomous uh, agents uh, and also uh, data driven approaches are more applied in the, in the energy system. Uh, for example, uh, you may be aware that um, in, in the network side, um, we have ex started to experience cyber attacks. Uh, one of such example is the, in the uh, Ukraine in 2015, we have more than 1 million uh, uh, customers has been dis disconnected. Well, if you look at another uh, part of the story on the consumer side, one of the biggest uh, uh, development for digitalization is the uh, smart meter data, smart meter kind of installation, but the, the, there are still a lot of problems around that uh, regarding uh, the privacy aspect, as um, there are actually quite a lot of sensitive information in the smart meter data, as uh, for example, uh, your incomes, your um, daily routines and uh, um, kind of even if the high uh, high enough the resolution it can even identify which TV you are looking at. So basically how uh, we can really utilize those data well preserve the uh, privacy uh, of the uh, customers. Uh, that's still a, a big open um, question. So um, overall, I think uh, my main interest is try to looking at uh, as we have uh, deeper decarbonization, there will be more 
reduce, let's say, um, marginal benefit of uh, development, but there will be increased uh, margin of, of risks. So what would be the right level uh, to balance this? So what is the right level of SMART we want to achieve? Uh, so that to enable that, I, um, I'm mainly working on the joint uh, cyber physical system modeling, uh, looking at simultaneously the uh, communication uh, cyber data layer and also the uh, physical layer uh, in order to develop a uh, trustworthy um, privacy preserving and also uh, resilient uh, digital uh, transition for the future in the systems. So I would like to uh, I can to uh, hear um, a bit more afterwards. If you have any questions around uh, digitalization, I will be uh, happy to uh, discuss. Thank you very much. Excellent. Thank you, Faye. Uh, just to remind people and the new, pe the new people who have just joined us that there is a Q&A uh, 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 box on the right of your screen and do feel free to put questions in there that, that you may have as we go along. Uh, but, but next up, uh, we turn to Maria Uliruka, uh, who's going, going to talk to us about her research. Over to you, Maria. Thank you, Adam, and hello, everyone. So I'm Maria, I'm a PhD student also in the IDOS project that Marco mentioned earlier. And my fo research focuses on combining two emerging trends in the scientific literature. On the one hand, we had a trend that energy system models get increasingly spatially and temporally resolved. And on the other hand, um, we start to account for the uncertainty in long-term forecasts in energy system models that advise us for the transition from today till 2050. And those two trends have been looked at separately because they're very computational intense. So if you would have a model that's highly resolved and includes the uncertainty of input parameters, it would take you weeks up to months. And if you have only four years of a PhD and you do one error in your model, I think this ruins your progress a lot. So usually you look at those two things uh, distinctively and I try to develop a method to combine both of them. But why can't we just neglect one or the other? So we want to have high spatial and temporal resolution because the energy system models in 2050 will be highly renewable. And as many of you know, the renewables are intermittent and their uh, generation capacity depends on the location. So we need to account for the different potential in order to estimate how much we can supply by renewables and how much flexibility and backup we need. And then the uncertainty, I think, um, appeared for everyone this late summer when the fuel prices for gas and electricity went up. Um, those input parameters such as cost for the fuels and the cost for technology, they can change over time. And if we design a system with a certain cost figure today for the future, it might be suboptimal or even unfeasible. So we need both. And I propose the method where you can assess for your model um, whether a resolution or the um, uncertainty is more important. And um, I applied it to the local authority of Winchester, where we found for a heat supply model that actually um, spatial resolution can be as important as the uncertainty in discount rates or the heat demands. So further, I'm looking forward to like further research on that because energy system models will become much bigger because they need to accommodate for the transport, power and the heat sector at once. And I'm very curious how people will tackle this computational challenge. Um, yeah, that's from my side and I'm looking forward to your questions. Super, Maria, thank you. And last but not least, uh, we have uh, Mr. Diego Moya from the Department of Chemical Engineering. Over to you, Diego. Thank you very much, Adam. Hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Diego. I'm a PhD student at the Chemical Engineering Department. Uh, my research is, is focused on the residential sector. This sector is um, an example of different challenges of energy system models. And one of those, or two of those, are uh, the technology complexity and also uh, that the system has many actors that interact with uh, each other. So, for example, we have policymakers, we have investors, we have uh, landlords, and we have tenants. And all of those uh, somehow interact and have uh, different patterns when they consume energy. So, to address these uh, these challenges, um, I'm using I'm using two specific uh, approaches. One each one one is. Uh, geographical information system uh, uh, approaches and also agent-based modeling. So the aim of my research is to try to uh, capture all of these complexities and uh, the heterogeneity of uh, actor's behavior within the model. So in that case, what we what we do is try to um, have a more realistic approach to 
to uh, evaluate the system because most of the models out there uh, sometimes they just consider one agent and one investor what they call it a, a, a representative agent or representative firm so in that case we try to disaggregate the market and have a more disaggregation of the of the analysis in order to inform um, policy makers and, and general stakeholders so that's my research Great, thank you very much, Diego, and thank you very much to all of the four presenters. Uh, a really interesting range of research there, focusing on very di different aspects of the energy system and and the transition, and that, well, challenges associated with it. So now I want to I want to open to Q and A here, a discussion with the four panelists. Um, and just a reminder, those the people, the attendees, um, I can see there are quite a few of you there, so don't be shy. Please do post questions in the chat. Uh, anything, anything you have, uh, either related to the things that the four have just spoken about, or things of your interest related to the design of future energy systems, these four people can tell you uh, have a lot of insight in these areas, and, and I'm sure we'll be willing to have a go at any question. Um, I want to, there's already a couple of questions in the chat, but I want to start off with with one um, and I want to direct this initially to uh, to Marco um, and probably others as well. But the question is, I mean, I see quite a few different types of energy models here and, and, and different applications, but quite different types. What would you say are, are the, the key differences between these models and how, how might that help us in answering these questions about a transition to net zero? Yeah, it's, it's a very good question. Um, so yeah, we mentioned several different types of these models. So the, the models that I mostly use are the cost minimization models. Uh, so as you mentioned before, Adam, uh, they take the perspective of a policy maker or a single decision maker and see what will be uh, the overall best uh, cost efficient uh, decision both in terms of investment and operation that will result in the overall least energy system cost in, in the broadest sense of, 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 of the term. Now that's of course a simplification as to how the actual world works. So the actual world is uh, uh, consists of a multitude of uh, different entities and agents that interact uh, at different time frames at different spatial uh, levels and so on so you have governments making decisions uh, setting up the rules setting up the markets you have the actual energy companies firms that invest you have the actual customers that make uh, decisions um, ranging from you know what sort of uh, a boiler or heating system to install all the way to what sort of uh, a vehicle they would buy and I would, I'm, I'm sure most people would, would agree that uh, it's not always that these uh, decisions are perfectly rational. So uh, I think I think the cost minimization models are good as the first proxy or as a sort, sort of a guidance as to where we should be heading to. So what's the sort of overall best traje trajectory? Uh, but I think I think there are some uh, uh, more detailed, uh, maybe behavioral models needed, uh, such as agent-based models. That actually uh, go into more detail in terms of how individual actors make decisions and how they interact with, with each other. So that's something that's not necessarily captured in a great detail in the cost minimization model. Uh, but that being said, as I, you know, th 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 these models are still useful to to give you the overall direction of travel. Uh, and I think you need to actually look at the whole, uh, all of these models, the whole suite, to uh, to give you. Uh, the full insight into the complexities that you might expect to, to see in the energy system. Great, thank you very much. Maybe if I if I could um, direct before turning to the questions in the chat, direct that same question to Faye, because this is a very different digitalization perspective. I think is a you know, interesting practical angle on that that issue. Yes, um, yeah, that, I think that's that's a, um, a quite big question to kind of uh, address and that's from different aspects. For me, I think uh, the main um, element here is is what kind of assumptions uh, that we should consider when we choose models. That's the biggest part um, uh, for me to investigate because for my, my uh, big part of my research is looking at kind of cyber attacks. 
uh, always fascinated when we looking because I originally my research was about uh, the physical element where you can model everything by uh, uncertainties, statistics. That's just quite easy, kind of straightforward mathematical models to to describe that. When I start to turn my research uh, for the cyber element, where particularly look at the intentional of people that involve making decisions, I found that's really hard to um, make the proper assumptions. I, I think that parts have to be um, carefully um, deal with before any any kind of conclusions that can be made. But one thing I want to to mention, uh, I think that's important is the transparency of the models. Uh, I always find that's 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 quite challenging. Everyone use different models. Even I mean, no matter it's cost of you know, optimization or agent based or kind of behavior model, agent based decision making. I think um, always find that it's quite hard to um, looking at different models and compare different conclusions where some of them quite sensitive when you just change a little bit of I mean, no matter the assumptions or model parameters. So uh, I think that's that's a big part to be interesting to looking at when we have look, looking at different models, uh, how we really can make them transparent. But I understand that the people that develop these models may have conservatives and, 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 and wouldn't share uh, the model. So I think there are that's bring to another thing that I work on is the privacy uh, element. So I also kind of quite interesting to look at how we can share all these models uh, where we can also maintain some of the core parameters um, private, but we that's can give people more or decision makers or whoever use the model more confidence uh, in that context. Thanks, Faye. I think this is a great example of the tension between openness and privacy. Um, which, which uh, I mean, as, as Diego has mentioned, with agent-based modeling, are very data-hungry models. We, in order to try to understand that future, you need very good understanding of, of behavior, but uh, equally difficult to get because of privacy issues and proper validation. OK, I, I want to turn to the Q&A, um, and I'll, I'll start with the first question that's come in there, and I, I think I'll address this to Marco because I believe it's quite close to your heart. Um, this, the question is, have the impacts of wind droughts as a result of climate change been looked into for energy systems such as the UK, uh, with, with that very heavy investment in offshore wind that you mentioned? And what would be needed to create a resilient system in such cases? Yep, very, very good question. Uh, so that, that goes right to the heart of uh, what's called the Dunkelflaute issue. So that's, uh, that's a, a German term which refers to a, a period of uh, dark, windless days. Um, so, so yeah. To, to to give a bit of a background, so so we've had a period, I think, in March this year, where uh, the output of the wind fleet in the UK was uh, uh, roughly in the order of only twenty percent of 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 its nominal output. Uh, for I think something around uh, uh, two or three weeks. Uh, so the question is. If we now uh, start to build more and more offshore wind, and the economics seem to suggest strongly that the UK at least should go for for offshore wind because uh, it's it's the cheapest uh, uh, resource in terms of producing a megawatt hour of electricity. Uh, the question is then: Yes, what happens if uh, you build more than 100 gigawatts of those uh, uh, offshore wind turbines, and then you suddenly have this sort of an event which takes a few weeks? And you get very little uh, uh, energy out of your wind turbines. Um, so um, I'll, I'll ju just skip really briefly to the to the, the, the there's one question: how to actually uh, cope with that in general terms? And it, it has already been happening. And if you look at the the past data, uh, uh, the weather data, you will see that there are these periods of uh, up to a few weeks of very very low wind speeds. So it's 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 not uh, only something that's been brought about by climate change, uh, but of course a lot of people have been raising a valid question whether uh, climate change will actually make these periods uh, uh, more severe or more frequent. So the impact of climate change on that is is something which is outside of my uh, my research, but. I know there are people at Imperial looking at that, so but th that's obviously something we will need to take into account when we uh, try to find solutions for these uh, uh, low wind periods. Uh, but what you could do to kind of protect the system from 
uh, getting dried up uh, of energy during those weeks is to build some sort of a st strategic uh, energy uh, storage, like energy reserve on the side. So that could be, for instance, something like hydrogen. So you could you could build your strategic reserve that you could just keep on the side and then just use it, you know, once every few few years when you encounter this sort of a, a, a problematic period and that could help you right, right through. Now, how to best configure that? What's the best size of that? These are all the research questions that uh, uh, we and myself in particular uh, I'm hoping to address uh, very, very shortly. Uh, but yeah, that's that's a very, very valid question, uh, especially for decarbonizing uh, the power system going forward. Great, Th thank you very much. So uh, now I think I'll, I'll move to the second question, which actually is one I, I find very interesting, but I'll direct this to Maria. Um, the question is, what is the time scale for technologies like direct air capture to become a viable option? Then some various sub questions there. How will the required scale up impact the energy system? And if, if it doesn't happen in the next five to, to 10 years, is it over for these technologies in the fight to reach net zero? So I will base my, the answer basically on the experience I had when we looked at the decarbonization of heat in the context also with industrial demands, domestic and commercial demands in the UK. And there are measures, for example, uh, or like the industrial sites where you can easily or like cost efficiently apply CCS, for example. So you give the model the option to invest and it, it's cost effective, so it likes this option. Um, however, if you go further in time and the emission limit gets stricter, you need to go for options that are more costly, right? Like the model would first choose, as is the cost of optimization, the cheapest option. And in that case, you can see that duck, like for example, direct air capture, as you are specifically, but also other negative uh, emission technologies become much more relevant. So for example, if you would unlimitedly make biomass available, at some point it just likes to compensate basically for the emissions at the given price of biomass, rather than going all net, like full on zero without being net zero in the end. And Regarding the time scale, I personally don't think it's over for those technologies if they're not ready in five to ten years because they will be actually really relevant for the last percentages. Like they should become on the market as soon as they can, but I, I personally see their importance rather in like a 15 years time on where they need to basically yeah, make up for the emissions that are very hard and very costly to, um, to abate and where we first have to basically have a societal discussion whether we want to have much higher bills or we want to go for negative emission technologies. Um, so yeah, that would be my point to this question. Great, thanks. Yeah, it's a, it's a really interesting class of technologies, carbon dioxide removal. Um, and as we see from the IPCC uh, work, huge uptake potentially, and that mostly in the second half of this century, up to up to almost 10 gigatons a year potentially of carbon dioxide being removed from the atmosphere by either direct air capture or various other options. Um, but uh, how society deals with that, I agree, is a very, very difficult uh, issue. If anyone's interested in more details, um, a, a colleague of mine, Neil Grant, has been doing some great research on this about the role of carbon capture relative to other technologies, which is which well worth a look at. Um, OK, so there's maybe a general question here to to the panel, but starting with Diego. Um, this is a general question is what what are the policy changes do we need to see to achieve net zero. Let, let's focus on the UK to start off with uh, because it's a big question. But any thoughts you have on policy changes? Thank you, Adam. Definitely there are, uh, it's, it's a very uh, provocative question actually. Might be some, there are some obvious things that we definitely need to do, but sometimes governments are, uh, I don't know, maybe um, they, they aren't that brave to take that, those decisions. Now definitely fossil fuels is something that we need to think about. In the future, we have a, right now three quarters of the whole emissions comes from fossil fuels. So definitely we need to think a way to by mid-century to get, get rid of it uh, somehow. We need to plan ahead uh, a way to reduce uh, those emissions that come from fossil fuels. And sometimes governments, they, uh, they don't actually uh, think in that in that part. Uh, so for example, in the, in the, in the scenarios that I'm running for, for, for my research, I see 
that there are some the technologies that are uh, free of uh, or, or that are not based on fossil fuels definitely are the ones that may help us to reduce emissions to net zero emissions by mid century so that's one of the options but there are uh, other. Uh, there are. It's gonna be. There's gonna be. There, there is gonna be an impact in the economy because the economy runs uh, based on fossil fuels. So definitely, we need to think ahead. Uh, what uh, what else we need to do in order to uh, not only uh, transit to a new energy system, or, but also to move to an, a different energy economy system as well. Because we need to think in, in, in other aspects as well. Uh, for example, income. For example, uh, I don't know. Uh, maybe to think about. What, what is going to happen with people that cannot afford some specific technology because they don't have the budget to do it, so for example. So that's going to be another option that uh, policymakers need to think about when, when we think in these kind of technologies. That's great, thank you. And um, does any anyone else in the panel want to comment on that, either maybe from the markets perspective or, or the regulation and privacy perspective? There's a bunch of issues there. I can, I wouldn't, how to say, comment from the market perspective, but I personally like working on the heat decarbonization. I would really welcome high, like, uh, try a stronger guidance on um, the retrofitting of housing. I mean, they have now the strategy, the net zero strategy has been emphasizing this point more, but it, I think it makes a great leap uh, for heat generation if the demand overall just is reduced. And so I think, uh, and then also for in, the, in order for the industry to decarbonize, there needs, I mean, there have been their own trials and initiatives, but always the policy needs to be very strong in their direction and they need to stick to that direction because that's a high, high investment for companies to make. If they don't feel that the investment is worth and secure, that will, it will not advance as fast as we would like to see it. So I think they can make, um, how do you say, by sticking to what they promise, they can make a huge difference for the speed of the transition, actually. Maybe I, uh, sorry, uh, maybe I can also add on um, that we are discussing about the uh, the privacy elements. So yes, I, I think um, so currently uh, the government has pushed quite a lot for kind of network side data accessibility and, and the openness. Uh, I think ne next wave of discussion will be on kind of more private data, smart meter data, what will be the best way to uh, more can, uh, make them open accessible and while at the same time to um, protect the privacy. I think the key thing governments have, I mean, from what I have been uh, research, uh, there are a few elements I think that's that's quite important to to consider for from government perspective in terms of data accessibility. One part is um, the con consumers need to have to uh, make uh, informed decisions. Now we have we, we did some survey about when people selecting um, the way they prefer to share data, but they, they are given choices now. You can share your smart meter data at a half hour level or not. Um, but what we found from survey is really, really not everyone understand what does that mean when you share different level of data. So um, most of people think the smart meter data is less significantly less sensitive than this kind of transaction data or um, or financial data uh, or medical data. But actually, um, given the development of machine learning um, algorithms, actually there are a lot of sensitive information that can be um, digged out. So I, I was slightly worried um, once those decisions are made um, for kind of roll out of very fast um, collection and, and and high resolution data shared if something happened in the future that's really really going to hit back quite significantly as as consumers are not properly informed at that stage a second thing is i think it now it seems to the government will take a, a one kind of approach fit all uh, methods to protect uh, the privacy or the level of protection, but what we have found in the, in the surveys is that particularly for privacy is really, really divert. Um, so also some, some of the um, um, questions about the standardization, I think that's important, but also I think when we have to deal with about more consumer level data in the future, which is key for the digitalization, I think the customization will make it more all inclusive and the um, customer needs to have uh, the um, kind of options to make their decision and the we need to uh, provide a platform that is inclusive and, and consider different um, preferences of, of consu consumers and at the same time we can really benefit from this heterogeneous state. We cannot have one approach fit all kind of methods for privacy. Yeah.
Thank you. I think that that some very good points and some some huge challenges. I mean, we're, we're hearing a lot about challenges here. I, w I wonder, you know, how much we can hear about solutions as well, which is this is a really the really hard bit here, of course. So, but since since we're talking about data, let, let's I think it's worth turning to one other aspect of data. It's a bit different to what what Faye is just talking about. It's about data in models. Um, so the question about is it necessary to have standardization of data, but I think also more broadly there's a question about data quality. Maybe Maria could could comment on that. Yes, given that I, for my work on the uncertainty, I need to needed to analyze um, basically the available data sets for the UK and uh, commonly used references and energy system models, which are often from BASE, so from the government or from National Grid or Ofgem. And um, first of all, it's like to be honest, to be in the shoes of an energy system modeler, I would say it's hard to get long periods of data. So um, you have to often combine a lot of sources. You have to then also not all the sources reveal the methodology, even if they reveal the methodology. For example, when I compare different reports of base, they're inconsistent. They do different assignments of demands and stuff. So there are very much hurdles to get to the initial state of having an input data set where you're happy with. And um, therefore, I think also it's especially relevant to have tools like the sensitivity analysis where you then first would run your model, then you analyze which of the input parameters is actually the most important for my result or like the, the, the research question I'm trying to answer. And then you, you go back and you're like, OK, how good is this information? How sec secure am I in it? Or like how to say, how, how confident am I that this is a good estimate? And how would the solution change if it's not? So I think this is. In, there's no quick answer then to this and therefore I would I really appreciate this question because it's a, a dear one to my heart when I started my PhD I basically was shocked how bad the, the input data is or how bad in a sense or how good it needs to be an engineer to do assumptions and to be like okay that's a fine, fair assumption this is a much uh, how to say a risky one and then you have to assess uh, how your assumptions input your result impact your result as phase it so um, yeah, I would appreciate if data would be standardized, the methodology would be clear, it would be clear which sectors are comprised on it, what is excluded. But then we shift again to this, this privacy aspect that if you reveal too much, you re like you're not protecting the ones you're gathering the data about. So there needs to be a balance, but there's certainly things that can be done on a national level to, at least in my opinion, improve it. Yeah, the data quality quality always a, always a huge issue, and it's remarkable how much academic effort goes into getting good quality data, and uh, you know, to figure out processes which which improve that situation would always be very welcome for us at least. Okay, there's quite a few. Was actually at least three questions uh, being posed by the audience relating to the role of nuclear energy. Um, which I think, think is a, a good question for the UK, given its history with the nuclear industry. Um, and also, as Marco has pointed out, excellent renewables resources, particularly offshore wind. So um, I'm going to ask Marco first on this. So what do you think is the role of nuclear in the UK's future uh, electricity system or energy system more broadly indeed? And you know what? What are the uncertainties which which that hinge upon? Yeah, thanks, Adam. Um, so it's it, it's a very good, very valid question, and you know we we do get asked this quite a lot. Um, so obviously the UK has some some nuclear <coughs> resources already. Some of them are, are scheduled to uh, uh, decommission over the next ten or ten or so years. So that let's say beyond twenty thirty or so you would have uh, two, only two major nuclear plants that are still operating. So one would be uh, uh, the, the, the older one, the size will be. And then uh, another one would be the one that's currently being built uh, at Hickley Point C. Um, I mentioned a white paper we've done uh, in June where we try to look at uh, the cost optimal portfolios of generation and storage technologies for the net zero carbon electricity in the UK. Uh, with the currently uh, 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 with the current best estimates of cost of different technologies, so including nuclear and wind and uh, energy storage, uh, the numbers strongly suggest that at the current uh, uh, cost uh, levels, nuclear does not really compete well 
with uh, offshore wind in the UK context, uh, meaning that, of course, we would like to keep the existing, uh, 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 those two nuclear units that I mentioned, that they should keep operating. Uh, but unless new, new units uh, can get at least a third uh, or ideally even 50% cheaper than uh, the cost of uh, uh, the construction of Higley Point C, then there's not really a good case for expanding uh, that nuclear base. Uh, if, and some, some, some people from the nuclear industry uh, argue that with replication of the, of the new nuclear designs, you might be able to get uh, a, a, a lot of the costs down and a lot of the costs uh, uh, when it comes to building nuclear is actually the cost of financing because a these are absolutely huge projects that they're projects that uh, take up to 20 billion uh, pounds of investment cost and secondly those are projects that take a lot to build so uh, unlike things like uh, you know wind farms or, or, or PV farms uh, you would typically you know, need at least uh, t 10 years or so uh, uh, to to actually uh, get your nuclear project from, uh, you know, start start of construction to, to getting it fully operational. So, so th those things do not play in favor of, of nuclear, but if these cost uh, reductions uh, actually materialize, then our results suggest that, yeah, we, we would probably like to build a few more uh, of these big, big nuclear plants. Um, but, but still, we still find that even in that case, uh, offshore wind will probably still be more cost efficient. Uh, so there we will have a mix of, uh, uh, of both offshore wind and some of the energy uh, coming from, from nuclear, even in that case. So it's, what, it, it, it's, judged, it's judged by the, by the uh, uh, it, it's all determined by the cost. And as I said, the cost numbers at the moment point strongly in favor of, of uh, offshore wind in particular. Thank you. Very clear. OK, let's let's um, move on. So, um, Faye, so there's a there's a question here, which is about basically um, the future of personal individual carbon and energy efficiency taxation. And I, mean, I think just maybe a slightly different angle on the same question for you is that what how do you see the role of digitalization aiding consumers in in helping with the energy transition? Yes, um, I, th I think that's that's excellent uh, a question to discuss. I mean, the role of digitalization for supporting consumers that that's a big part uh, of of the question. Um, and uh, I think um, one example I have mentioned that the smart meter data that's really really quite uh, rich. There are a lot of information that can actually be uh, be utilized there to inform the. Um, Kind of consumers' behavior and the selections in terms of how they use the electricity and and when and where to to use that. So I think that that's the smart meter data. I mean, I mentioned that while well, we have to keep it private, but also that that is a, a key element for for the consumers to participate to participate or make choices about their um, their kind of tariffs and also how they engage with with the system. That that's the basic uh, get gateway. So I I believe that one important element is. Um, we have to develop technologies that we really can uh, utilize the data in a way that uh, is also can be private, but also can inform um, the retailers or consumers or di uh, distribution uh, network um, users to utilize the data to make to improve the um, the system uh, operation and also feedback more important to the consumers to change their behavior accordingly because most of the, the consumers are engaged or uh, supporting uh, the uh, uh, decarbonization and how those information can really fit back to those uh, consumers is also a big part of the story, uh, I believe. Perfect, yes. I think it could be, could be a huge role there in demand response and aiding with that sort of intermittent uh, energy system. And maybe the, the same question to Diego on, on this personal individual carbon and energy efficiency taxation, given that you use agent based models where you know, people's incentives are, are kind of built in. What, what, what do you think about um, you know, the necessity to have uh, incentives and do you have any thoughts on the types of incentives needed? Thank you, Adam, for the question. Um, yes, when we use these uh, geographical information systems, 
we realized that there are some uh, areas where there are some people that have a specific budget. And sometimes they, they don't can reach the cost of the most efficient technologies. So the main assumption that we are doing there to run the simulations is that they have some incentives for the government. So definitely there is a huge uh, um, uh, part of the huge areas so or a lot of people that might not uh, be able to, to afford these kind of technologies in the, in, right now. So either for the transition, they also might need some uh, um, transfer, grants transfers in order, in order to achieve or in order to, uh, to, uh, uh, to get this kind of technology. So uh, when we use these uh, agent based models, we can also we can also model, uh, and we can also um, quantify uh, or calculate how much could be those incentives from the government. Great, Th thank you very much. Um, okay, so we've heard a lot about a lot of different aspects here, and and. Um, yeah, I think uh, it's fair to say that there's a huge range of, of questions out there which are of you know, pressing importance for society uh, from a variety of different angles, both the, the government's angle, the consumer's angle, from industry, uh, all involved. Um, there's still quite a few questions in, in the chat. Now, I want to, I want to turn to one on uh, energy storage because it's something which uh, I, mean, I, I find very interesting. Personally, we, we've recently participated in a study which looked at global interconnected grids. So the, the possibility that you can connect, you know, perhaps across Southeast Asia, through South Asia, across Northern Africa, and you know, provide reliable supply of energy. And perhaps some of you may have seen an announcement by um, by Modi, the, the Indian um, Prime Minister at, at COP26 on this One Sun, One World, One Grid initiative and the UK's Aligned Global Green Grids initiative. Um, so, so very much a, a current topic. So the, the question is, um, is this possible essentially? You know, if the wind isn't blowing here, maybe it's blowing somewhere else. What, what do you see as the key opportunities and challenges for such an idea? Um, I, I think probably a lot of you can help answer this question, but I'll start with Marco being the electrical systems guy. Yeah. yeah. Well, thanks Adam. Yeah, it's uh, again, very, very interesting question. Um, I guess intellectually it's a very appealing concept uh, and you know if the world uh, worked perfectly, uh, if, if the human, human race was uh, was all, all, uh, all about cooperation, then that uh, would probably work out as a good idea. So, so I think, uh, yes, it, it's, as I said, intellectually appealing because at some point uh, uh, there will always be sun shining somewhere in the world and there's probably, the, there'll probably always be wind blowing in some part of the world. So if you interconnect the whole world, then Kind of uh, uh, get rid of those problems that you know you, you have you have sh local shortages somewhere. Um, the issues or challenges that that spring to my mind first is a technical one: uh, building such uh, a long distance uh, uh, energy transmission networks uh, cost a lot of money. So uh, you, you typically uh, build them, uh, you know. Uh, at length of a, of a few hundred kilometers, which is wh where they where they make sense. When you go into thousands of kilometers, then you know the cost of building them has to be uh, justified by uh, very high benefits of, of 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 installing those. So that that that's one potential challenge. Uh, the second one that I see, I, I think it's much more geopolitical, and that's nothing to do with my <laughs> engineering perspective. Uh, but I think I think neighboring countries uh, have a lot uh, tougher time agreeing on, on some very, very simple issues, uh, let alone, uh, you know, collaborating with uh, uh, countries on the other side of the globe on projects that are multi multi billion dollars, multi billion pounds. Uh, and also another <coughs> related aspect is that that essentially means if 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 you're the UK and you Put your trust into uh, uh, building those links with uh, uh, with different continents. That you have to actually have to put your trust into into getting your uh, your energy reliably through those links. Uh, and you know, 
things like geopolitics always come in sooner or later. And, and what if someone wants to use or abuse their power uh, by having control o over uh, the flows of energy and use that for whatever political means? I I'm sure that's something that crosses uh, the mind of uh, any, any politician uh, thinking about that. So yeah, j j again, a very, very uh, intellectually very valid idea. Um, but with, with some of the challenges uh, that will need to be overcome. I think that, that that's a, a great answer. So there is it's huge potential opportunity, but the practicalities are, are um, well, a significant barrier. Um, OK, so perhaps a, a question for um, Maria. The, there's a question here on building heating. Um, it says building heating represents a significant demand on the energy system. Um, to what extent do system models consider the energy quality, so the temperature of the heating? And um, is it like exergy efficiency, is it, is it really taken into account? Maybe you could comment on that, at least for your own modeling. Yeah, um, no, so there's also an interesting work of the Energy Systems Catapult that looked into the heat demand and whether we predict, for example, increasing heat demands or um, decreasing ones. And it's definitely a point that with, how do you say, with the time passing, the comfort temperature in the UK, for example, went up. So people tend to heat their homes now more to a higher average temperature than they used to. And um, you also, yeah, as you said, you have your heating, but then you have, of course, losses. And so you have to take into account whether inside of the house it's comfortable. And usually if you de develop demand profiles, yes, you take this into account. So there's also, of course, a completely different uh, field of modeling, which focuses on buildings and perhaps even on like smaller district levels, like multiple homes where they can in detail model the characteristics of the, um, the wall and like the, the losses over the wall and the insulation um, mechanisms, et cetera. And then they model the temperature profile in the house. But usually for bigger energy system models that at least I work with like uh, on like a local authority scale or a national scale, there you would use this in form of the heat in like heat demand profile you put in. And then also you can, of course, balance it with storage. So for example, if you have S or C pumps, you can use a water tank to balance the amount you need in order to maintain the, state, the steady temperature. So the, the aim, the overall aim of the energy system model should indeed be the comfortable room temperature, not the supplying the equivalent amount of gas or like the same amount of heat, but really the, the aim is to model such that you can have a comfort temperature and see how you can supply that by different means. Um, so yeah, that's taken into account, but of course, like basically not in the same model. It's a feed into the energy system model. If that answers, I hope that answered the question. Otherwise, we can refine. Yeah, no, I think I think I think that, that that's a good answer. So certainly, models attempt to take this into account. It's it's not not a particularly easy thing to do with a sort of large scale optimization model where you have non linearities, a lot of issues there, and if you can go into building physics and various different types of heat transfer and uh, a huge, huge range of issues as you go into more and more detail. OK, we're, we're approaching the end, but I think probably time for just two more quick questions. So firstly to Faye, there's, a, there's an interesting one here is about, I'd love to hear your thoughts about designing in trust in future energy systems. How is trust gains standardised, protected and managed? Yeah, I think that's 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 a, a good question. I think about uh, that's also directly linked to what I mentioned. The the trust is built on informed decisions. That's that's quite a big part how we can engage really consumers and also the relevant parties into the whole this uh, decision um, process and leaves options really to individuals that can make it. So um, that will be basically a, a balance between standardization, I think, and also customization. Um, people will have their uh, different preferences when we want to involve individual uh, consumers. Uh, if I'm looking at the consumer level, I think these two things that I, I mentioned is, um, I already mentioned that one is the uh, informed decision, uh, give the try to understand all the data, that potential element or potential infringement of uh, information inside the data when that was shared. Uh, second is uh, about to really 
look people differently. Um, there, particularly when we go to trust, the trust level, I believe, is really a quite wide range of different uh, among people um, that have been considered um, in in terms of when, when we design a trustworthy system. Hope that answers the question. Thank you. I, th I think that's great. It's a very very tricky question, and uh, I think the best that we can do in the time that we have. Um, okay, final final question, and. Uh, it's difficult to choose. There's still quite a lot of interesting questions in the in in the Q and A, unfortunately. But I'm just I'm going to go just going to go for one, which uh, uh, I'm going to be selfish and go for one I'm interested in. And that that is that uh, I've heard that electric vehicles will play an increasing role, not only in transport but as energy storage for future energy networks. How how significant do we think this will be? And does it really change the the overall equation of you know how much intermittency you can have out there, and uh, or is it just going to be superficial? Um, I, I'm gonna gonna open this to the floor, but may, maybe if we start with Marco again, given the electric systems aspect. Yep, thanks. Happy happy to to uh, to uh, try and answer. Um, uh, absolutely, electric vehicles are, are not just uh, a, a great means to decarbonize road transport, uh, but also it's a great way to uh, add a lot more flexibility to the power system, which is again amazing for uh, uh, allowing the system to cope with the intermittency of renewables. Uh, we've done a huge amount of work on showing uh, and, and, and quantifying the exact benefits of uh, going for uh, approaches like smart charging or even vehicle to grid where you can even discharge vehicle batteries. And what we show in a nutshell is that uh, if people uh, uh, adopt these smart uh, intelligent charging approaches uh, without any compromise on how they actually and when they drive the vehicle. So the only thing they do instead of come home, plug in and charge straight away, they come home plug in and let some sort of intelligence decide when that charging takes place. For example, it, it's a lot better to charge during the night than to charge during the, 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 the evening peak demand. So we've shown that uh, uh, there are massive benefits to be obtained by the system if uh, electric vehicles are integrated into the system through the so-called smart charging regime rather than just uh, uh, following this business as usual approach. So that's absolutely true. So I'm, I'm completely on board with that uh, with that remark. Perfect. Th thank you very much, Marco. And then unfortunately, we actually don't have time to open to the rest of the panelists. We, we are out of time, so sorry about that. So I just like to to round up today by saying firstly, thank you very much to our four panelists, uh, Marco, Faye, Maria and Diego. And that to, to the audience, I hope that gave you a, an interesting insight, which will at least piqued your interest in energy systems and their design uh, in, for the coming decades. Hugely challenging area and a lot of interesting stuff going on here at Imperial for you to engage with. So we hope you'll stay with us uh, for this afternoon for the Future of Energy Festival, Festival keynote lecture. So that's Creating Transitions in Energy by Professor Tim Green, co-director of the Energy Futures Lab and deputy head of Department of Chemical Engineering here at Imperial. He's going to be looking back at how energy research landscape has changed over the eight years he's been at the Energy Futures Lab, lab and looking ahead to challenges and opportunities for the future. It starts basically now in one minute at 3 p.m. Uh, and and there's, there's uh, going to be a link in, in the Q&A, I believe. So thank you all very much for your attention and uh, I hope you enjoy today and the rest of the festival and good afternoon.